it's very hard to escape the underlying narrative that like there's a man in the sky who controls everything. In this case, we call that man Jerome Powell, right? I think that's a, a, a super simple narrative that people adopt because it's easily explainable, right? It allows us to put the problems not at the design of the system or a fundamental misunderstanding as I'm describing, and instead simply say, well, it's his fault, right? It's, it's their manipulations that are preventing this from occurring. I, I just don't think that's true. Michael Green, Chief Strategist and Portfolio Manager for Simplify Asset Management. Thank you so much for joining me on the show today. Oh, thank you for having me, Julia. Well, Mike, it's great to have you and you're someone who's been requested by the viewer. So I'm especially excited to have you on. And I was kind of hoping, Mike, we could start with the big picture. What is the big picture macro view for you today? Well, I, I think the, the key question that most of us are struggling with is, you know, when are we going to ultimately see the U.S. economy or more accurately, the global economy, because it does seem fairly synchronized, move into a more recessionary environment? We've had a tremendous amount of stimulus. We've had an unbelievable amount of recovery growth coming out of the COVID pandemic. And now it really becomes a question of what is the character of the hangover for that, right? Um and I think there's a lot of debate and a lot of discussion around exactly what that looks like. And it's confusing because we're seeing very different outcomes in labor markets, housing markets, financial markets, et cetera. Yeah, it it is confusing. It is perplexing. What is kind of your thought, though? Like, Are you expecting a recession? Are you more in that camp? So I'm very much in the recession camp. I think that we're actually um, probably already in one. Once revisions are fully taken into account, we'll probably find out that they declare that the recession started in Q2 of 2023. It's possible that it's Q3, but I don't think it really matters all that much. Uh, we're starting to see the unemployment numbers rise. We're starting to see the duration of unemployment increase. We've already seen many of the interest rate sensitive sectors of the economy deteriorate. But again, because those are deteriorating from um, you know, what I would describe as such a low level, when I start thinking about things like automobile produ production, for example, you know, we're at 15 million auto units being produced in the United States versus 19 million if I go back you know, to uh, the immediate aftermath of uh, September 9-11 when we moved to 0% financing for the first time, right? So it just is a very, very different character and feel to the market than we've had in the past. We're also dealing with the dynamics of having underbuilt housing for an extended period of time in the aftermath of the global financial crisis. That in turn is creating a lot of questions around what does the actual housing market look like, right? What does new construction look like? How trapped are people in their homes? How trapped are they in their mortgages? Is this a benefit? Is it a disadvantage? Candidly, we don't know because we just haven't seen these types of events before. Yeah, we haven't seen this before. What about the labor side of things? I want to hear your thoughts there. Well, the labor side is actually really interesting because it's very much bifurcated and it's a byproduct of, again, policy choices that we made. So what we see, you know, when we walk around and we see help wanted ads everywhere, there's an unbelievable shortage of low skilled or underskilled workers, people that would traditionally have, you know, made the beds in a hotel room or have served you fries as you you know, go to a restaurant, um, those workers are actually in quite short supply. We see this in terms of the help wanted ads that, that you know, people post everywhere. And most small businesses are directly exposed to that dynamic where they experience shortages in workers that they traditionally have kind of taken for granted, right? Now, the interesting features about that is if you actually look at the labor supply picture, We've seen a contraction over the last two decades of roughly 20% of those who have less than a college degree. So the absolute number of workers that would traditionally be competing for those jobs has fallen, a combination of much lower than expected immigration and also an extraordinary push to increase college attendance for those who are moving post high school. Um, on the flip side of that, we've seen roughly a 50% expansion in terms of the number of people with college degrees. And while that does ultimately make people more flexible in terms of the careers that they're able to pursue, we're also seeing pretty strong evidence of oversupply in those areas. And so the employment prospects, the premiums associated with attending college have actually deteriorated. And we're seeing interesting levels of weakness amongst those with college degrees where the unemployment rates have risen from traditionally in the neighborhood of 1% for that subsegment of the population. Today, we're looking more like 2%, it's about 2.1% actually. 
And so you're, you know, that type of unemployment has doubled that characteristic is part of what I think is causing a lot of stress or a lot of perceptions that things are much worse because those who, you know, did all the right things, attended college, pursued that college degree are suddenly facing diminished prospects versus what they were probably led to believe as well as significantly higher levels of debt. Yeah. I was, I was going to ask you that too, um, because that's an interesting point. The diminishing prospects of a college degree, like you said, they did all the right things and they also have high levels of debt. Um, I want to hear more on that, like how, because we are going to have the resumption of student loan payments. Like, how do you think that affects things as well? Well, I think that's one of the key uncertainties, right? Is that we've seen those households that carry significant quantities of student debt have have meaningfully benefited from, you know, uh, the deferral of those payments and the the ability to capture that cash somewhere in the neighborhood about three hundred and fifty dollars a month you know, that they simply haven't been paying, right? And it's not like there's evidence that they've been saving that. The evidence is is that they've raised their standard of living. They've been spending it on various things that improve, you know, their day-to-day prospects, even as it establishes, you know, a a challenging environment to go back to paying those bills, right? Um, The biggest complaint that I have about it is actually not so much the student debt aspect of it as much as it is that the mechanisms that we've put in place for how to allocate those student debts, we've failed to provide young people with the price signals that would allow them to choose effective careers, right? Um, A really simple example of that is if you were using private market solutions, the interest expense, right, the riskiness that would be tied to a student loan for somebody going to MIT and getting a degree in electrical engineering would be fantastically lower than that of somebody choosing to go to a private liberal arts education and getting a degree in French medieval literature, right? The employment prospects, the ability to repay that MIT degree are almost unquestionable, you know, like there, there's actually a firm, uh, uh, SoFi that's now publicly traded that had an expression for it, high earning, not rich yet. So the, the point that I would actually emphasize is this, this dynamic that we've robbed this, the system of the price signals that would actually tell people where they should be getting their degrees. And as a result, we have a shortage of STEM graduates and we have a surplus of various forms of liberal arts degrees in which there's not a very clear benefit in terms of the employment prospects, and yet they incur the same levels of indebtedness, et cetera. I think it's just a genuine disservice that we've done to young people um, in today's economy. And I think, unfortunately, it speaks to the unfortunate types of interventions that most of us who are on the more conservative leaning would point to and say, you know, This is a mistake that the government has made. The government has made it worse. Unfortunately, where we make those mistakes, they tend to be because we've robbed the system of the price signals that are required under a capitalist system to work efficiently. Yeah, I like that. That's such an interesting point too, like the price signals and also like just the the potential for earnings based on certain types of degrees. And you pointed out a shortage in STEM degrees. And it also makes me think about... um, artificial intelligence, AI, and the impact that's going to have. Maybe it's still early innings, but is that something you're thinking about as well for some of these, um, some of these jobs? I I think that it is really important to appreciate how profound the implications of AI can be. Um, A number of people, myself included, have made the analogy that this is not dissimilar to the steam engine for uh, the industrial revolution or to the mechanization of agriculture. And then suddenly there's a very real prospect of automation of services, which has powered the economic growth really since the 1950s in the United States, right? So we've gone, if you look at the the rates of economic growth in the United States and you split it into manufacturing, agriculture, and services, services has grown at somewhere in the neighborhood of eight to eight and a half percent per year on a, on a GDP equivalent basis. That's powered all of the growth that we've seen really for the past 70 years. And now suddenly you're talking about a very real prospect of introducing automation and turning services into products, right? So AI is no different in its potential implication of saying, I want somebody to write poetry for me, or I want somebody to write copyright materials for an advertisement. It's not meaningfully different than buying a dishwasher to replace a you know, an actual uh, servant, right? A household servant. 
you've seen these types of changes take place in the past. We tend to take them for granted in terms of their implications. But when those changes occur, you see significant disruption, things like the introduction of household automation, the dishwasher, the vacuum cleaner, et cetera, change the trajectory, particularly for female employment during the 1920s and 1930s and created conditions under which there was a tremendous amount of stress that emerged on household budgets. That was, again, very much characterized like what we see today with the decline in immigration pressure to be able to find and, and train staff to do those somewhat menial jobs at the exact same time that productivity enhancements were being introduced. And so I think there's a lot of commonality between those types of periods and what we're seeing today. It's just we're super early in the deployment of it, right? So, you know, the scripts that you do for your um, podcast, for example, I would imagine that at this point you can actually do things like go on to ChatGPT and say, hey, could you give me an outline of topics that I could discuss with Mike Green? Uh, I know I do that on a very regular basis. I feed anything I write through chat GPT or an equivalent to create a summary. I'm not trying to use it to go out and find information because it has this or to cite sources because it has this propensity to imagine stuff, right? It's very much like a seven-year-old if you were to ask it to do something on that front. But in terms of taking my writing and summarizing it and making it much more accessible and easier for people to process, or for me to make sure that I've made something clear in my writing, it's just an extraordinary talent that you know really replaces many college educated workers who would otherwise be doing that type of role. Now, yeah. a, a lot of it, again, I just wanna emphasize, like I wouldn't have had a college grad who necessarily did that before. And so it's not like I'm only replacing somebody, right? But the potential is absolutely there. And it, it becomes really interesting to see who's going to benefit from this, who's going to be disadvantaged by it. We just don't know yet. It's too early. Yeah, you're right. But yeah, you're right. The, just the the efficiency of it. Um, I I can tell you, like anecdotally, I had a conference and then I mixed up my two panels, and so I was like, oh, I prepared too early for the other one. I used an AI assistant to get generate topics and questions, and it ended up being just fine. Um, and yep. it was spot on with the, I just typed in their names and it gave me great questions. But yes, I totally see that. Um, but yeah, it's still early. Well, it, it also it, it also creates a really interesting dynamic, right? Because suddenly your capability to broadcast and to prepare and to do more things has been enhanced in the same way that, you know, the CEOs of very large corporations benefited in their ability to control and manage much larger organizations with the introduction of network technology in the 1990s, right? That's a direct component that feeds into the ability to manage these previously unimaginably large institutions um, and contributes to a lot of the inequality that we're seeing in the world today, right? Is it fair that you're able to replace recent college graduates, um, you know, with a chat GPT or get rid of the assistant that you otherwise might have had? Your life quality is dramatically higher. Your individual productivity is higher, but somebody gets hurt in that process. And the question is, how do we choose to share the benefits? How do we choose to acknowledge the costs associated with the deployment of these types of technologies? It's going to play a critical role in determining the broader societal impact of this stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I certainly, I don't, I certainly don't know the answer to that question, but it's certainly something. Yeah, we do have to think about what are some of those, uh, those uh, implications of it. Um, Mike, I want to go back to this notion of you being in uh, the recession camp, because I, I have a kind of just a curiosity of my own that I thought about. And to me, like I'm a little perplexed by the markets this year. Um, I guess like what, where's the disconnect between like, okay, we're in a recession or we're going to, I guess it'll be announced or whatnot. Why is it that the markets have been going up? Can you help me understand that? It's been perplexing to me personally. Well, I, I think it's perplexing to a lot of people, and there's elements of it that I would be lying if I didn't say it was perplexing to me. So, um, But what I'm well known for is the work that I've done on the implications of systematic and passive investment strategies and how they can lead to exactly this type of phenomenon. And so I would just highlight 
that when you think about the way that markets work, we tend to think about them as incorporating information, right? So we, the term, the efficient market hypothesis is one that many of your listeners will probably be familiar with, but it's this general idea that the markets represent the best available information with lots of smart individuals trying to deploy capital in a way that most accurately prices all that information, right? So if I think Apple's earnings are going to be higher than somebody else's, theoretically, that means that I want to buy Apple. I want to participate in the gains associated with Apple. Unfortunately, that's really not how the markets have worked for you know, over a decade now, where the vast majority of money that is going into markets is actually coming in through passive vehicles that don't make any of those calculations. They presume that other people are making them for them. And when you have this type of dominance of these passive and systematic strategies that are simply allocating money because money was given to them, and then choosing to allocate that money in proportion to what's already been placed into the market, you enter into a separate set of issues, which is the markets themselves are not frictionless. So the process of buying into a market or selling out of a market actually violates the entire uh, precept on which this whole passive investing phenomenon is based. All right. So if you look at the actual um, academic literature behind what is supposed to be passive, a passive investor is one who never buys or sells. They simply hold. All right now. How do they get into the market? Well, that's magic. How do they get out of the market? Well, that's magic too, right? And so if you believe in magic, then this can work, but that's not actually how markets work. Markets represent transactions. And when I choose to buy something, I'm creating frictions that impact the price. And so what I actually think is happening by and large in markets is simply that because the employment markets remain relatively strong and because participation in things like 401k plans has risen significantly, and because those 401k plans devote almost all of their resources, actually more than 100% of the money that's coming into the market is now coming in through these passive vehicles, it's amplifying the dynamics that you're talking about. And so if I look at the behavior of markets, I think it's really important to distinguish which market you're talking about the larger the market cap, right? So the NASDAQ 100, for example, or the S&P 500, the better it's done. When you move into the smaller companies, those that tend to be bought by people who are actually engaged in this discretionary thought process, the Russell 2000 is basically flat for the year. By equal weight, the Russell 2000, the smaller companies in the public markets, it's actually down. The majority of stocks are down, even though the NASDAQ's up you know, 35% sort of thing. Um, and so I, I think that's a big chunk of the confusion. And unfortunately, that confusion that you're experiencing, and again, I, 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 as I said, I'd be lying if I said I could, didn't personally find it perplexing that we're seeing this actually play out to this magnitude. That same information is flowing through the policymakers who are then saying, well, the economy seems ridiculously strong, right? Obviously, asset markets are trying to forecast something off into the future and telling us that growth is going to be very robust. Therefore, we should hike interest rates even more, right? Um, and so that sort of is what I really think is unfortunately happening in this environment. Yeah, let me um, try to like double click into some of this with you. And I'm I'm certainly not an expert, so I apologize if some of my questions seem a bit naive. But that's an interesting point. You point out like the Russell 2000 has been flat this year, um, yet the other markets not so much. And um, a lot of that are these passive vehicles, I take it. A lot of those are ETFs. Um, can you help me understand, um, or maybe help the folks understand how this works or the ETFs? Is it because like they have a lot of these names? Maybe it's we kind of know the big names that are responsible for the bulk of the returns. Is it because they're appearing multiple times in these ETFs? Like, how does the kind of structure work, if you will? Yeah, so so that's a great example. Um and just first, I want to clarify. So uh, the firm that I'm the chief strategist for, Simplify Asset Management, we do offer ETFs. ETFs are simply, uh, it stands for Exchange Traded Fund. It just means a way in which um, your transaction is entered into or exited from. So a traditional mutual fund, you can only get in or out once a day. That execution is done everybody at the same price, what's called the NAV. 
exchange traded funds are basically identical vehicles, but you can trade them intraday, right? So if you can buy and sell in quantities and your price may be different in experience than my price, right? So that I just want to emphasize that it's not about ETFs or even mutual funds per se. It's about the strategies that you're choosing to deploy. So I'll, I'll give a really simple example. Let's say you decided to buy the Vanguard Total Market Fund. If you bought the Vanguard Total Market Fund, the ETF ticker is VTI, right? Then what you're doing is, is you're going in and you're buying basically every publicly traded company in the United States, roughly 3,500 stocks. You're going to buy a fractional representation of each of those. And they're going to be represented in proportion to what's called their float adjusted market capitalization, which is simply determined by the number of shares that are outstanding times the share price. Effectively, what this means is you're buying a lot of Apple, a lot of Microsoft, a lot of NVIDIA, a lot of Tesla, a lot of Johnson & Johnson, et cetera, and very, very tiny amounts of smaller companies. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, that type of strategy has become the dominant mechanism for people to participate because it's the default investment for most people in their 401k plans. Uh, and there's a broad acceptance of this idea that we should all be diversified. We should all choose to participate in the equity markets. And when we do that, that we're by and large just free riding on the system, the hard work that's being done by the analysts to try to set those prices. The problem becomes when the dominant vehicle becomes the passive vehicle. The quantity of money that is actually flowing in under those vehicles becomes so large that they themselves are influencing the prices in a meaningful fashion. Does that make sense? That makes sense. So let me, are we just creating, because it's if that's the dominant strategy and it's just passive, are we just like blindly going in and creating an asset bubble here? Absolutely. That's exactly what we're doing. Well, well, okay. And if it's all the buying and that's the dominant strategy and you're buying and that's the default, my question, because I, you pointed out earlier, was this kind of like the 401k is the unemployment um, holding up. What happens when there's the selling? So, so that is actually where it becomes really interesting, right? So you've had two factors that have been in play. One is that you've had market share gain by these passive strategies. When I started in the industry in the early 1990s, passive share was between 1% and 2% of the total market. Today, it looks like it's closer to 45 45%? Yeah. Wow. In the U.S. markets, it's about 45%. And that's including passive investment vehicles like the Vanguard and Black Rocks. It's including futures markets. It's including what are called total return swaps that are often used in the institutional space. It's including separately managed accounts that are managed as if they are passive vehicles. It's including what's called commingled investment trusts or collective investment trusts, I'm sorry, CITs that are unregistered mutual funds, et cetera. When you run through the math and you figure out what fraction of the market is currently being controlled by these types of passive allocation vehicles, it works out to about 45% of the market at this point. And just to emphasize, because it is gaining share, it's significantly more than 100% of the flows. And this is one of these confusing things uh, because the younger generation, their market share of passive is close to 95%. So somebody under the age of 40, almost all of the money that is invested by those under the age of 40 is done so through passive vehicles. The older generation, the baby boomers, et cetera, they're only about 20% passive. And so when you blend that out, that's where you're getting the 45 but the direction of the market is just moving inexorably towards this increasingly passive representation. Um, and then it becomes a question of how much friction do you think is actually created by this behavior, right? How important are the individual flows? You know, analysis that was done by JP Morgan, for example, would suggest that over 90% of all transactions at this point in time no longer involve anyone doing any sort of fundamental calculations. Wow. Which sounds crazy, right? But that's unfortunately the reality. So I guess the other following question um, from your perspective, how much of a risk does this pose? 
So I think it poses a significant risk, but perversely, um, I use the analogy of driving a car uphill with no brakes, right? There's tremendous risk in that activity, but as you're driving uphill, it makes almost no discernible difference. I can slow the car simply by removing my foot from the accelerator. The problem is if I crest the hill and I start heading down and I actually haven't addressed this issue of no brakes, then it really becomes a problem. And that's what you're referring to when you say when the selling occurs. Yeah. It is inevitable that you will encounter events under which selling occurs. But I can point to in the history books at this point about five days in history in which there have actually been net redemptions from passive vehicles. Unfortunately, those would include days like some of the uh, the market crashes during COVID, for example. Those were examples of days in which we saw passive selling. And uh, you know, I try to emphasize for people like the most frightening thing that I heard within the markets coming out of COVID was a self-congratulatory message from Vanguard, which was less than 1% of their clients tried to sell. And my reaction to that is, oh my God, what if it had been two? Oh, wow. What, what? Okay, let me ask you this then. What do you do? Like, how do you, I mean, this, I, I take it like this is a, a big risk you see. It's a concern you have. What do you do? Like, how, how do you kind of, how do you navigate? So it, it, for it's the, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it, look, it's challenging on two fronts. One is, is that you actually have to participate because if you are not actually participating, you're just going to get fired. Right. And so, you know, many people in the popular press have heard the disparaging reference to Chuck Prince at Citigroup going into the global financial crisis and using the phrase, when the music's playing, you've got to dance, mm -hmm. right? But unfortunately that's true because any financial advisor who chooses to simply step to the side and allow something like the 35% gain that we've seen for the NASDAQ on a year-to-day year -day basis and simply say to their clients, it's a bubble, it's a bubble, it's a bubble, it's a bubble, they'll eventually get fired and their clients will go hire somebody who has participated in the bubble up to that point. So it becomes very self-defeating. Um, so the, there are ways that you can participate, but you absolutely have to play, right? You have to get up and dance in this type of environment where the car is still going uphill. And that is one of the perverse aspects of it is that if my models and theories are correct, that the system has moved from one that tries to predict outcomes to simply one that reflects the realities of flows tied to employment. So as people have jobs, money flows into the market <clears throat> and we see prices go up. When people lose jobs, those contributions cease, potentially they start taking withdrawals and the markets would fall, right? So the markets are not offering a prediction on that basis like they might have historically where a discretionary manager would choose to increase or decrease their exposure based on their view of either individual company fundamentals or of a macro environment Increasingly, the system is becoming dominated by these flows that simply are a reflection of the world's simplest algorithm, which is what governs the passive vehicles. Did you give me cash? If so, then buy. Did you ask for cash? If so, then sell. That's all we're doing at this point. Yeah. So it's it's such a I I really appreciate like you coming on and explaining this. Like it's, it's so I feel like we don't have this conversation enough, or maybe I'm I'm missing it, but you got my wheels turning. Like it, you really make me think about this. Um, so I want to also just bring up, cause going back the demographic part of it, um, mm -hmm. you mentioned boomers having, I think it was 20%, I guess they're maybe boomers do more active uh, and then younger. Kind of, yeah. Can we explore uh, just the demographic bit of it and how that's affecting markets and how you see that kind of continue to affect markets? Sure. So, so the growth of passive and systematic strategies has actually been a byproduct of a regulatory change in environment, as well as a what I would describe as a mixed change in environments. So if I go back to the early 1990s, very few people really knew of John Bogle or Vanguard or of ETFs, right? The first ETF was introduced in 1994, the first index fund didn't emerge until 1975. That was one of the Vanguard products and was remarkably poorly subscribed. Um, in 1994, the rules began to change to actually encourage the growth of passive strategies. They were given regulatory advantages and the ability 
ability to use futures that weren't available to many other mutual funds. And in 2006, the rules changed quite substantively with the introduction of the Pension Protection Act, which was under the Bush administration. That suddenly changed 401ks from what had been an opt-in selection. So you got a job. If the firm offered 401ks, you were given the opportunity, but not the obligation to participate. Um, and you had to make that choice. And then you then subsequently had to make an election in terms of how you wanted to allocate your capital. And so participation rates up until 2006 were relatively low. In 2006, we changed that from an opt in to an opt out system. In other words, you defaulted into allocations. The minute you did that, you suddenly had to choose a default investment so that if somebody opted in or did fail to opt out, that their money just didn't sit in a money market fund in cash, that it was automatically invested. And so in 2006, what was called the qualified default investment alternative was introduced. This was the default investment when you opted in. In 2006, those were typically things like balanced funds. So things like the, the um, PIMCO products, right? The bond and equity combinations. Under lobbying from Vanguard and others in 2012, that QDIA designation shifted to what are called target date funds. And so most people will be familiar with these. They'll have designations like the 2065 fund in your 401k, the Vanguard 2065 fund or the Vanguard 2035 fund because I'm so much older than you are. But you know those are vehicles that automatically allocate individuals across bonds, equities, international, domestic stocks, et cetera, and do so simply on one very simple question. When do you plan to retire? That's it. That's the only question that they ask, right? They don't ask what your risk tolerance is. They don't ask about your ESG qualifications. They don't care about your pronouns. They don't care about anything except for how old you are when you expect to retire. Those became the default investments in 2012. Today, about 85 cents of every retirement dollar is flowing into these target date funds. All right, so that's like, if you just stop and think about that in terms of concentration of risk for the American public, like this is a really extraordinary change that's occurred without most people being aware of it. It's also one of the reasons why many mutual funds, which would have historically uh, com you know, competed for participation in 401k plans or in IRA platforms, that they are experiencing such challenging environments because increasingly with target date funds, they're simply locked out of the system, right? Um, the reason why all this matters is, again, going back to this articulation of what it means to be a passive investor. And so again, if you go back and you read the literature, and there's a fantastic paper by Bill Sharp in 1991 called The Arithmetic of Active Management, where if you've ever heard the expression that, you know, well, passive outperforms because passive owns the same thing as all the active managers in aggregate, they simply charge lower fees. That's the paper that actually introduced this thought process. This is the first reason why people began to understand how passive could outperform over time as compared to simply allowing you to be mediocre, right? So it changed the, the terminology and the lexicon around why you would choose to do passive. It was simply suddenly viewed as better. The problem with that paper is it's also where it's articulated that a passive investor is one who never transacts, right? So you don't buy, you don't sell, you just hold. And there's no way to do that. Like you can't, that just can't actually happen. Um, and it was really only in the past about 10 years that you've started to see individuals, myself included, academics, a number of other very smart people that are involved um, are beginning to actually point this out and say, wait a second, that doesn't make sense, right? There's a problem here. And um, unfortunately, the evidence is growing stronger and stronger that a lot of the distortions that we're seeing, a lot of the craziness and behaviors Everything ranging from rising valuations to rising extreme, what's referred to as inelasticity or that gappiness that you see in stock prices often can be laid at the foot of these types of strategies gaining share. Yeah. Again, this is such great information and I, I'm so thankful to have you. Can I just, I want to hear a little bit more on the in inelasticity of the markets. Can you elaborate a bit on that? Sure. So inelasticity is an economic term that refers to the change in, um, in price tied to changes in supply and demand. 
And so something that is highly inelastic is going to see a large change in price for small changes in supply and demand. The traditional models of markets, particularly the stock market, have assumed that markets are highly elastic. In other words, there's very small incremental changes in security prices or incremental amounts of information that comes in that would then change the supply and demand. Really simple example of this is the actual parameterization or the models that are built around the, the implementation of um, if the efficient market hypothesis, what's officially called the Grossman-Stiglitz paradox, right? So let's not get caught up in, in the nonsense. But the estimates under those models is that a dollar into the market changes prices for the aggregate market by less than 1%, right? So a 1% increase causes significantly less than a 1% change in price. What we're now discovering, because our mathematical techniques, the computing power is significantly more robust, right? What we're now finding is, is that model is massively misspecified. So under the traditional implementation of EMH, the efficient market hypothesis, you would presume that a dollar coming into the market changes the price by about a penny. It actually turns out that a dollar into the market changes the market capitalization by roughly five to $17. In other words, the EMH models are misspecified by 500 to 1700 to one. Like this is, I mean, that's not even remotely close enough for government work, much less for the allocation of the vast majority of Americans' retirement funds. Wow. Um, the, okay. So, the, okay, again, I'm just going to say like, this is such a, a fascinating discussion, like kind of this force that we're seeing play out. Um, I kind of want to shift topics and maybe there's <laughs> some relevance here too, because when often discussing markets, a lot of folks talk about the Federal Reserve's influence on the markets, the impact of interest rates. Um, so yeah, I'm shifting to the to the Fed. How how do you think of the Fed's role in the markets? Well, I think one of the great things is, is that, you know, just in the last year, year and a half, you've seen um, what I would describe as a narrative that people use to explain how markets behaved, largely torn asunder, right? So the argument for a long time was markets are expensive because interest rates are very low. The Fed is artificially manipulating interest rates to very low levels. Therefore, there is no alternative and stock prices now have to rise. Ironically, we're now looking at interest rates that have risen, you know, 525 basis points and 5.25% uh, in English, I apologize. Um, and as a result, interest rates across many areas of the economy are now higher than we've seen in many years. There's actually very clearly an alternative just in the form of money market funds that people could allocate their capital to. And yet, perversely, valuations are as high, if not higher, than they were when interest rates were low, right? We've known this if we actually were uh, thoughtful and looked across Europe, where you actually had negative interest rates, and yet valuations were much lower than the United States. Japan has had low interest rates for an extended period of time without any discernible impact, et cetera. And so clearly, there's something else that's going on. Um, but it's very hard to escape the underlying narrative that like there's a man in the sky who controls everything. In this case, we call that man Jerome Powell, right? Um, I think that's a, a super simple narrative that people adopt because it's easily explainable, right? It allows us to put the problems not at the design of the system or a fundamental misunderstanding, as I'm describing, and instead simply say, well, it's his fault. Right. It's it's their manipulations that are preventing this from occurring. I, I just don't think that's true. I do think that there is actually a role for the Fed to influence things. But perversely, it comes through what's called the portfolio rebalance channel. And it's actually, again, tied to these target date funds. And I'll just give a really simple example of how this can play through. So imagine you're running a portfolio that is mechanically rebalanced to 50 percent weighting between stocks and bonds. Right. The Federal Reserve shows up, hikes interest rates. What happens to your bond prices? They go down. 
right? Because the interest rates have gone up, so the bond price has to go down. Now I've got a portfolio that I need to rebalance because my bond portion has lost money and my equity portion may have been unchanged in that environment. So what do I have to do? I have to sell equities and buy bonds. And so equities will then fall after bonds fell. The bond prices will rise slightly as I allocate additional capital to them. And then when the Federal Reserve steps in to raise interest rates again, the bond prices will fall. I have to sell equities, et cetera. This is, again, what's called the Portfolio Rebalance Channel. It was introduced by um, uh, Hannah Lustig, who is a professor at Stanford Graduate School of Business, enhanced by some MIT professors, Jonathan Parker, and there's some fantastic recent literature. But part of the reason why I emphasize all that stuff, I just want to like clarify for your audience, I don't want to expect you to go look up the work of Zhu Lu at Stanford's Graduate School of Business, but just to highlight that like that paper was written in 2023, right? So the academic literature is exploding in real time as we begin to develop the mathematical techniques and as we begin to recognize the impact that these strategies are having on markets. But the theories and the regulatory framework are all built off stuff that was done in the 1950s. So it's just a, so, a totally different time too. Like totally a- different time, right? I mean, remember... The, you know, some of your audience may be familiar with terms like the cap M model, right? The capital asset pricing model or beta or alpha as terms, right? Um, portfolio management theory, right? Uh, um, these are all techniques that were developed in, in a time period in which we basically had to do our math on slide rules and primitive calculators, right? The advent of um, significant quantities of pricing pricing processing power, I'm sorry, didn't emerge until well after these theories became dominant in portfolio construction. And so we're, we're literally, it's like we're, you know, trying to circumnavigate the globe in the time of Columbus using the ships from, you know, Egypt, right? Um, it just can't be done properly. And today we don't think twice about traveling across an ocean, but it's actually quite hard to do with old technology, right? So we're suddenly discovering that the theories that we operated under are just fundamentally false, but turning a battleship the size of the U.S. retirement system, which is, you know, give or take $22 trillion in assets and has large entities like Vanguard and BlackRock, whose objective is to largely keep the system as it is and protect their market position and not admit to these issues, right? Because it'd be a terrible thing to admit to you're actually creating conditions under which the problem has to get much worse before it can get better. Wow. Get much worse before it can get better. It, okay. Um, and, and I love like how much knowledge you have on theories. This is so amazing. Um, are we, are, so are we operating off of outdated theories? Oh, fantastically outdated. I mean, it's again, just to, you know, imagine I told you that your speedometer was calibrated to take you from zero to 60, right? And it turns out actually your, your speedometer takes you from zero to 600, right? You think you're going 60 miles an hour, you're actually going 600 miles an hour. You're like, gosh, this is really amazing. Why is everybody so slow on the freeway? That's very unsafe of them, Mm. right? And you're the one that's going 600 miles an hour. Um, That's not dissimilar to the problems that we're experiencing right now, where we're seeing the largest companies grow by almost unfathomable amounts because very small sums of money are being put to work. So um, I, I write a sub stack, you can access it through my Twitter account. My Twitter account is profplum99, totally random that I ever became a public figure. I didn't expect it. So you'll look at Twitter and find a picture of Wallace Shawn from The Princess Bride. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, he's got an even bigger forehead than I do. Um, the you know So if you, if you go and you read some of the stuff that I've written, I actually walk through an example of how we saw something like NVIDIA's price change to the extent that it did in the last month or so. Um, And it actually turns out that it can be done on fantastically small sums of money, right? So NVIDIA has a market cap somewhere in the neighborhood of a trillion dollars. If I were to tell you that you put in a $10 million order, which is not uncommon in the institutional space, And I told you that that $10 million order would cause the price of NVIDIA to rise by 0.08%, right? So we're talking tiny sums. This is, 
you know, for a dollar going in, this is significantly, this is basically, you know, one, uh, one, you know, eight one hundredths of a penny increase in price, right? Your reaction to that, most professionals that I talked to be like, yeah, that makes perfect sense. And then you realize that that $10 million order has increased the market value of NVIDIA by a billion dollars. Right. The same thing is happening for Microsoft and Apple, et cetera. And they themselves are buying back billions of dollars of their own shares every year in a manner that has to have these types of frictional impacts. Right. So very small sums of money are leading to exceptionally large impacts and things like market capitalization. And then because of the rules of passive, which locks into place that market capitalization as being, quote unquote, the right price, it becomes a self-reinforcing dynamic. So if it's small sums of money that can like move it to those like levels on the upside, at some point, could it even be relatively small sums that move it to the downside? Does it work on the downside the same way? Uh, well, it, technically, it could work even more violently. Right. So um, the trade that I'm known for is tied to a vehicle called the XIV, which is an ETF, uh, the inverse VIX ETF. Um, my initial work on that actually led me to the conclusion that this was a systematic strategy, very similar to the dynamics that we're talking about playing in a much smaller market. So those products had grown to about 70 percent share in terms of the daily volume. And, you know, I was able to figure out in advance that on a relatively small change in the in the U.S. equity markets, roughly a 4% decline, that that product was likely to go to zero. Um, that is exactly what happened. It went to zero on a 3.9% decline in the S&P 500. Because the selling that came from the systematic strategies overwhelmed the order book, it exhausted the liquidity in the market, and the only solution set for it was to go basically straight down. Now, the S&P 500 and some of the equity markets have various rules built into the futures markets through circuit breakers that reduce some of those risks. But the really critical thing to understand on the downside about most of these strategies is that they carry no cash to meet redemptions or create their own what's called endogenous liquidity. And so a fund that I run will typically carry, a discretionary manager will typically carry around 5% cash in their fund, right? Now that can be a drag on performance if markets are going up, but it also creates optionality for the manager. If they get a redemption, they can meet that through cash. If they identify something that they want to buy, they don't necessarily have to sell something immediately in order to buy it. And so these, you know, this optionality has value within the world of investing. But the passive vehicles dispense with that. And so a, another example that I give people is the world's largest actively managed mutual fund is the Fidelity Contra Fund. And the Fidelity Contra Fund is about $100 billion in total market capitalization, total assets in the fund. It carries about $2.5 billion in cash, so about 2.5%, right? That means that they have $2.5 billion to do whatever they want with it to meet those sort of optional components. Redemptions, unfortunately, are a significant fraction of it, but also, as I said, they could buy something because it goes on sale without having to sell something in a market event. Mm. In contrast, the world's largest fund, right, so as distinct from, from active, now we're talking passive, is the Vanguard Total Market Index that I referred to earlier. Across its various share classes, it looks like it's about $1.6 trillion in total assets in that vehicle. It carries about $80 million in cash. Wait, $80 million? Or $80 billion? Million, million. Million. Oh, wow. Okay. Huh. So the only way that that can actually accommodate redemptions is by selling. And they probably have to sell their winners, I assume. Well, they don't have any choice, actually. I mean, when you say sell their winners, right, they're going to sell everything in proportion to its market capitalization. And so, yes, perversely, that actually does lead to you selling more of stuff that has gone up. Um, but you're really turning into a vehicle that is demanding liquidity from the market. It needs somebody else to show up. This is why I go back to that March 2020 example. And I say, oh, my gosh, what if it had been two? Because when money goes into these vehicles, because they don't hold any cash, they put everything to work. They're providing liquidity. But when redemptions happen, when they try to exit, then they're demanding liquidity. Mm. 
right? And that type of size, if you were to think about a vehicle like the Vanguard Total Market Index at $1.6 trillion, a 1% redemption, right? That's, you know, $16 billion that has to be sold. That's a lot. That's a big, big number. Even if it doesn't seem like it in today's world, those are really big numbers and flows. Wow. Um, you know, again, you've given me so much to think about. Um, we only have a few more minutes. So I I want to bring up just another idea because um, you mentioned like how there's that narrative of it's all about the Fed, if you will. Are there any yeah. other narratives out there that are top of mind for you that like, that's just so off that people are missing? Because it's such a fascinating conversation. I'd love to, if you have any any other narratives that are pervasive in the market. Well, I mean, look, there, I think there's a lot of them. Um, you know, I, I mentioned one earlier, which is this general idea that, you know, passive vehicles simply mimic the behavior of active players in aggregate. That's simply not true. Um, it's increasingly untrue as you have this reinforcing loop of the most money being allocated to the largest stocks and their liquidity not scaling in proportion. And so just to give this example, right, Apple is about 7.5% of the US market capitalization today. If you're an active manager managing your portfolio under the rules of the 40 Act, which is what my funds need to be managed under, and you need to maintain a level of diversification, you can't hold 7.5% of something. Right. You're limited to about 5%. You're also limited in terms of the concentration of the top 10 holdings in your portfolio. That means that indices like the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ 100 or certainly the XLK technology ETFs, for example, that those are not diversified vehicles. And yet they're being granted exemptions that allow them to be marketed as if they're diversified vehicles. Um, this is, you know, the the general narrative is something along the lines of you know well the problem with active management is there's just too much competition and there's too many active managers competing away the opportunities eventually passive will get large enough that they'll be able to participate perversely it works in the opposite because the more passive vehicles grow the more these behaviors become self-reinforcing and perversely the more cash that the active managers have to carry because somebody has to carry the cash to allow markets to function in a liquid fashion, right? And so right now we're seeing the opposite. We're seeing active managers try to reduce their cash. We're seeing them try to keep up with the markets. That's creating conditions that, that power the market higher in and of itself because uh, cash within funds is being allocated um, eventually that process reverses itself and, and, you know, you can just imagine a scenario where the, um, if I, you know, just do the math on the historical example where an active manager carries about 5% cash when the market was hundred percent active managers, that meant that 5% of the funds were carried in cash. That optionality is robust today, just to make it simple and say that passive is 50% of the market and active managers have been forced to keep up. Your average active manager is only carrying about two and a half percent cash. The passive vehicles are carrying none. That means that the market is only carrying 1.25% cash versus its historical levels of five, right? So there's very little cash on the sidelines to protect the market unless people on a discretionary basis decide that they're going to step in and buy. So the, the, these are all feedback loops that tie back to the same underlying phenomenon that the system is just becoming increasingly robotic and algorithmically controlled and the risks are rising because of those dynamics. Yeah, the risks are rising. Um, Mike, I have to say, I've really enjoyed listening to you. I took a ton of notes and you've given me a lot of things I want to go um, read more about. Um, before we wrap up though, I was hoping maybe we could just learn a bit more about you, your background and the work that you do at Simplify Asset Management, if you don't mind. I'd just love to hear more and um, you know, even the decision to join Simplify. Sure. So um, I've been in the hedge fund space for a long time. I've been doing various forms of asset management for about 30 years. Um, I have a very traditional background for somebody in the space. I went to the University of Pennsylvania's Wharton School of Business majored in finance um, and proceeded to you know, bore my wife and children for years and years trying to find just the right way to communicate how exciting finance is to them. 
Um, uh, I, I've now got three kids, all of whom seem to be going in that direction. So I, I, I may have succeeded by osmosis, but uh, they certainly didn't enjoy any part of that process. Um, I uh, uh, managed mutual funds and then hedge funds for a number of years, started a hedge fund that was seeded by uh, Soros and also um, uh, then managed the personal capital of Peter Thiel. Um, and then in 2020, uh, the opportunity to, to launch Simplify was created by that sort of regulatory change that I was referring to before, where a lot of the strategies that I have traditionally been involved with, these types of derivative strategies that we emphasize at Simplify, um, and they can, they can benefit from some of the stuff that I'm highlighting, um, emerged. And so a regulatory change called the derivative rule suddenly meant that you could create ETFs that incorporated the types of strategies that were historically only available in hedge funds. At Simplify, we've grown our product offerings across what are called alternative investments, now offering things like commodity trading advisors, commodity funds, um, interest rate funds, fixed income funds. I run a macro-oriented fund. Um, and, you know, we've been extraordinarily fortunate to have, have had a positive reception in the marketplace. We're one of the few who's actually growing in the space. Uh, and we're now just about $2 billion in assets under management, which sounds like an incredible amount of money until you realize that that's basically one day of inflows for Vanguard. So um, I like to joke with my investors that we've just begun and that, you know, we're, we're extremely pleased with the way things have gone. But I've worked for two and a half years now to get one day of inflows for Vanguard. Um, and in terms of finding out more about us, you can go to our website at simplify.us, um, S I M P L I F Y.us. I'd already mentioned my Twitter account, which is a combination of very esoteric discussions of finance and economics combined with uh, posts of food because I like to cook. And um, I also write on a sub stack uh, called Yes, I Give a Fig, which refers to the macro fund, but more importantly, talks about all sorts of issues ranging from finance to social dynamics uh, to, you know, my thoughts on um, uh, politics or, or policy choices that we're currently making. I love it. And I love following you on Twitter. Wait, what's the story with um, the handle Prof Plum 99? Is there a story there? Uh, well, there, there is a story, but uh, you have to take yourself back into the 1990s. So the internet is just emerging. I'm actually, I need a uh, Unix handle. And so Prop Plum 99 was a joke because it refers to the game Clue. My name is Michael Green, Mr. Green, or Dr. Green. And therefore it became uh, Professor Plum was a, a simple play on that or a joke. When I transitioned over to the internet, the, the Prop Plum itself was taken. And so I added the 99 to it. And then, as I mentioned, the character on uh, my avatar is Vicini from The Princess Bride, um, which actually is, is an outgrowth of an experience that I had in the industry in 1999-2000. Um, I was uh, called the dumbest man alive by one of my investors um, in a non-joking fashion, right? It was presumed that I had no idea what I was talking about because I called into question the dot-com dynamic, telling people that I thought that this was a mistake. Uh, this individual labeled me the dumbest man alive, and I've always embraced that and basically said, you're better off actually believing that you're the dumbest man alive and just asking every sort of question out there rather than thinking you're the smartest man alive, which is what Bassini did. And, and so that character dies because of his conviction that he is the smartest man alive. I would prefer not to die for that conviction. I love it. Well, it's a, hey, it's a badge of honor. Um, <laughs> being happened. called the dumbest man alive or was was great. It's I encourage people to to write into the comments. Yeah, he probably is the dumbest man alive. No, it, you're it, not. It you're definitely my, not. My You've offense. given us so much to you know, think about, and I just appreciate you being so generous with your time and your ideas. Really appreciate you, Mike Green, Chief Strategist and Portfolio Manager at Simplify Asset Management. Thank you so much, Julia. It was a real pleasure. Thank you.